huge shout out to Mary Rose Padron, can you? <laughs> um, who is the Assistant Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, as well as Anna Gilbert, <laughs> um, who is the Special Events and Scheduling Coordinator. These two wonderful ladies have worked tirelessly to put together a really great week of programming for diversity inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion week. Um, in addition to all organized and our real assets to the Flagler community, so everybody give them a little round of applause. Okay, now to Erin. Erin is based in Jacksonville, just up the road, and she will be coming down to campus most Tuesdays throughout the semester, meeting with students and others, both on campus and off, to learn more about St. Augustine's people and the various histories here, all the while carving out some studio time, um, as that is incredibly important for any working artist. Erin um, received her BFA in studio art from FSU in 1999, and an MFA in painting and drawing from Georgia State University in 2003. Her work has been included in solo and group exhibitions, at venues such as the Yellow House in Jacksonville, the Cumber Museum of Art and Gardens, Florida State College at Jacksonville, the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Museum in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, the New Orleans African American Museum, and the Ritz Theater Museum in Jacksonville, among other venues. Beyond exhibiting her work, Erin is an incredibly active member of the arts community in Jacksonville, she is the recipient of the Jackie Cornelius Art Residency at the Douglas Anderson School of the Arts, the Lift Every Student Artist in Residence, and the Community First Foundation Arts, Art Ventures Individual Artist Grants. She is currently the Director of Education and Lead Visual Art Instructor at Jacksonville Arts and Music School, and in 2019 was named the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville's 2019 Art Educator of the Year. In addition to her art practice, her current initiative, Artist Types, helps practicing artists with career advancement by providing workshops, mini courses, templates for CV writing, artist statements, proposals, and more. For any of you artists out there, you know how incredibly important those are <laughs> as a working artist. So it's amazing work that she sort of had it this year. Sort of had it this year. <laughs> they do these really wonderful, maybe once or twice a year, open studios. So you can actually go and wander around and See what work is being made there and talk to the artists. So I encourage you all to keep your eyes and ears open for something like that. Um, I would also like to thank the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida for their support of the artist residency and other crisp programming through a grant from the Joanne, the Dr. Joanne Chris Feller Fund. Um, and then just for those students who just arrived, um, if you want to get uh, co-curricular credit, you can do a self-check-in the QR codes, there's a one on the table over here and one at the entrance, or you can come find me afterwards and I can check you in. Um, so, without further ado, thanks Erin, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I really, I told Julie I thought it would be like 10 people here, so it's more than 10, so thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> As she said, I am Erin Kendrick. I'm gonna to try to stay on the mic. Um, I'm a visual artist and I'm an arts educator. So I'm just gonna show you really just like a lot of pictures from like where I came from, where I am now, where I'm going. And hopefully you'll learn a lot more about me and my intentions as an artist and hopefully maybe get a little inspiration as well. So of course that's me and my website where you can find information. A little about me, like I said, I'm pretty simple. I'm a painter and an installation artist. I'm also a teacher artist. Um, I don't teach in a traditional school program. I'm really not interested in that anymore. I, but I do teach um, in, you know, like where I service school. So I may do a residency at a school. I teach in an after school program now, which I love. Um, I've been an adjunct professor. So a lot of different capacities, just not a full-time teacher. And what you see here, like the images that you see behind me in that picture, is uh, two paintings that I did uh, featuring my best friend. They are in the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Jacksonville. My best friend is a cancer survivor. And when they built this art collection for the hospital, I chose her as my subject matter. So that's what those two paintings are. 
this is me from way back in the day, like 99 and 2003. My graduation years really sound like forever ago, so I am like that old. <laughs> but that's me, I went to Reigns High School. If you look like me and you're from Jacksonville, people always ask, you know, like, did you go to Reigns or Rebo? It's like two schools that most people who look like me went to. And I am a Reigns girl, very proud of that. You see some of my friends there. After Reigns, I went to Florida State University, which Julie said in my bio, I am a diehard Seminole. And this is where I got my um, BFA. So I have a BFA in studio art. This is also where I met one of pretty much kind of like the most important people in my art career. And I only know him for a short time. I had a professor there. His name was um, Ed Love, Dr. Ed Love. He was a sculptor, big burly, grandpa kind of guy. Um, he was very like intense, you know, he was very intense. Like, I, you know, when you're in college, you kind of do things, you don't really think about what you're doing. Sometimes you don't make the best decisions. And I was a part of a group at Florida State um, that used to paint faces at the games. I don't know if they still exist or not, but you know, you go to the game, you go to the football game and they're like, paint your face. No clue to me at the time that that was a problem. And I went to class one day and he like grabbed, he didn't grab me, but you know, he kind of pulled me to the side going into class and he got like right up in my face. And he was like, you might as well be painting black face. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know, you know? I just, I didn't know. At that age, I just, I had no clue. So that was kind of like the type of person he was, you know? So that, that was the art teacher that I was interacting with early in this part of my life. And that really kind of altered how I see things and, and how I progress from that point. Um, I also went to Georgia State University, which is in Atlanta, for graduate school. The teacher that I was just telling you about, um, I met him in my sophomore year at Florida State. Um, the semester before I graduated, he passed away, which was pretty tough, pretty devastating to me. But it wasn't until then that I had ever really thought about grad school or had ever really like um, thought of myself like as a teacher in that capacity. So it was like when he did pass away, it was kind of like that was sort of passed on to me. And then I, I ended up at Georgia State. Um, Georgia State is kind of an interesting place. Um, it's in Atlanta, so it's very different from Jacksonville. You know, you kind of have a little bit of everybody there. This is a picture from me when I was setting up my thesis show when I was getting ready to head out, but it was a moment well before the thesis show that really kind of got me to this point. I'm gonna try not to like pass out talking in this mask. <laughs> um, <laughs> so like two behind me, you see the doors that are kind of like the entrance into the art building. And there was a day in school when I, you know, just a regular day, I was going into class. I come into the building you see that the gallery space is pretty much, if I'm coming in the building, the gallery space is gonna to be to my left. Um, the elevator is to my right, the door is behind me. So me, this like black girl, you know, young, um, trying to learn to be an artist, trying to learn to think for herself. I come into the door, to the left in the gallery that you can see straight on, is an image, I should have put it in here, is an image of uh, Renee Cox's photograph the Hot and Tight Venus, which is, if, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's an image of her and she has like metal breasts and um, a metal bottle. And it's referencing the Hot and Tight Venus, which is an actual person from history who was exploited in a circus. Um, so if there's me, you know, there's her. And then right at the door of the elevator was a service worker, a black female service worker. And it was something about that moment, you know, like the three of us in that space that really kind of changed the way, changed the, like the role that I saw myself playing as an artist. So, and then we went on from there. All right, so I did all the things. I went to school, I graduated, um, had all my shows, my thesis shows, um, and ended up staying in Atlanta for Let's see, another like four, four and a half years. And I taught high school. These are obviously not high school students, but I didn't really 
didn't know what I wanted to do. I got my degree at 26 and wasn't really being hired for higher ed. Kind of felt like what people were telling me was that I was a little young for whatever reason. And then ended up teaching high school. Um, fast forward, I started painting and then just kind of lost the will to do it. I didn't really want to paint much more so teaching became where I sort of like put my energy. So that's kind of what's gotten me here. I've taught, I've taught high school before, I've taught college before. Like I said before, I am currently the director of education and the visual art instructor at Jacksonville Arts and Music School. Somebody painted me on the wall, so that is me mm -hmm. in the middle. <laughs> if you're familiar with muralists, um, this artist is Cipro Cipros. I, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, Cipro Cipros or Cipro Cipros, and all of his work has those large ears, which I think is pretty awesome. And all three people in the mural, this is our director here, and on the end was one of the students. And these, of course, are some of my students in the image. I am very much about teaching my demographic. So um, call it what you want, but I, my students are in there learning about their place in history their place in the art world. It's not just visual arts. We have art, music, dance, vocal, what am I missing, film. <laughs> art, music, dance, vocal, and film. And they love it there. And we love it there. I love it there. So that's kind of where I am now regarding teaching. These are some of my kiddos. I teach everybody. So this is youngest. We go as youngest third, all the way up to seniors. So I teach a little bit of everybody. This is from one of my residencies with an elementary school. And this is actually what we call a road to safety quilt. So the students learned about Harriet Tubman and this idea, this notion that slave quilts were maps to the Underground Railroad. So the kids, uh, we walked their fire route. So when the building's on fire and you walk, you have what the direction you have to go to get out of the building, we had the kids walk that route and then they made a quilt that outlined that, that became the map for that. So this is their road to safety quilt. So you can kind of see some of the arrows in there. And all of these little illustrations and designs are either by them or by their parents, which is pretty cool. This is from um, the, you mentioned the Jackie Cornelius residency at Douglas Anderson, which is the School of the Arts in Jacksonville. If you notice, this is the day. Um, my photograph was taken for the mural, because that scarf is in the mural. <laughs> um, so you can see like the students here, um, now these, these are older students, these are more advanced students, so they're working on much bigger projects, so you can see some of the things that they were working on there. And these are from some of my college kids. Um, just, you know, your general drawing, professionals, and um, in an organi organization called Society for Creative Founders, so I teach in that capacity also. Julie mentioned that I did win Educator of the Year, which was pretty cool, in Jacksonville. And then just, I always like to let people know, because I think teachers should sort of have like a grounding point. Like what, what's, the, what's the point, what's the, what's the place that I teach from, no matter who I'm teaching? So for me, I do believe that creativity is problem solving. So I'm never, I am never just, teaching kids to paint or draw. You know, it's always about problem solving. It's always about kind of thinking through things. You should always start with the end in mind and you must find your own voice. So we talk about that all the time, like seeing the end at the beginning and then deciding like what's the path that you're gonna to use to get to that end. Um, she also mentioned that I have a, a business called Artist Types. Uh, I think, you know, most of us as artists, we make beautiful artwork, but sometimes struggle to write about it. So what I did was just create sort of like a template service for artists that makes it a little bit easier to get that done. Charles this says, Artist Types was created to help artists get and stay prepared for any career advancing opportunity by providing resources to aid with writing CVs, artist statements, bios, proposals, and more. 
Now on to the reason why you're here. It's my favorite shirt. <laughs> All right, so as an artist, I have to, my computer right here, I have to read this. So this is from my general artist statement. I examine the power of language as it relates to perceptions of and about black women and girls. I do so through the lens of the oppositional gaze penned by Bell Hooks, who recently passed away. This gaze cultivates the power to look, enabling black female spectators to document what they see and construct their own dialogue with their own voice. So what does that mean? It means that I am a firm believer that language and how we use words sort of drives perception. And historically, I think language has been, in essence, used against black women, you know? Um, or just, you know, black people in general. When you go all the way back to like, let's say slavery, and you hear or you're told that, you know, slaves are illiterate, you know, slaves are stupid. And that's mainly because they don't speak English, but they could be well versed in like their own native language. Um, if someone tells you that, you know, a slave woman is like a great breeder, you know, and then like that becomes as the, as the time goes on, it becomes like black women are hypersexual. You know, all these words that kind of define, have defined who we are. And it's not all negative, um, most of it is, but, or at least negative leaning, you know. And we're kind of in this time now, I call it sort of like, this sort of black girl renaissance, where over the last like 10 years, we've been sort of like redefining that for ourselves. And I think that's the essence of what Bell Hooks is saying, to kind of stare back. I don't know if you've been one of those kids that, you know, you know, you're, you, you, a parent or somebody stares at you and you can't look them back in the eye or you can't respond back to them. And I think we're in this moment where we are doing just that. We're looking right back. We're staring right back. We're redefining what, um, what and who we are in society. And I think it's happening out loud and it's happening in a lot of different ways. So over time, my work has sort of lived in that space. So I told you that um, when I was in Atlanta, I stopped painting. So if you've seen my work, you know, I kind of have like this, this is sort of like my style of painting. Back in 2008 when I was in Atlanta, this was the first painting that I did like this, kind of in this way. And I'll talk about like technique and stuff, stuff a little later. I started painting like this and then I just stopped. Stopped painting all the way until 2015. So this was from my first show in Jacksonville. And um, a few, um, not too long after that, this was one of the biggest shows that I was a part of in Jacksonville called Keisha that I was really, you know, I was all about this one because this was kind of like the essence of what I do. And the idea was for all these women artists, I had no clue there were, I think there's like 14 or 16 black women artists in that list. I had no clue most of them existed until this show. Um, and we had to respond to that, to that name and what that name meant to us. I made um, these two paintings that kind of work together. I am a painter, but I'm also an installation artist. So a lot of times, a lot of the times, how the paintings exist in the space, um, it's, that's a part of the piece. So typically if one painting is here and the other painting is there, there's some type of communication happening between the paintings that you, the viewer, are either going to participate in or interrupt. So as a painter, I'm still using, using space. Um, this one is, it's called Baby Did You Hear That? It's from an Outcast song, like I'm getting old. Y'all know who Outcast is? <laughs> Y'all know who Outcast is? Okay, good. Because my, my, my students at Jams didn't know who P. Diddy was. <laughs> I was like, what? So there's an Outcast song called The Art of Storytelling too. Um, if you're familiar with the album, there's an interlude before the song where Keisha, the little girl, is telling her grandmother that she's scared of the storm. Y'all don't know? Yeah, kind of. Um, 
And her grandmother is telling her, you know, don't worry. It's not going to do you any harm. I did pull the lyrics so I can reference this painting. This is like the under 3,000 verse. I'm not going to rap. I'm going to read. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, baby, did you hear that? Yeah, baby, I heard it too. Look out the window, golly. The sky is electric blue. Hence the blue. Mama Earth is dying and crying because of you. Raining cats and jackals. All shackles disintegrate to residue. Silly mortals having a clue as to what the F is going on. Um, I'm on the telephone dialing the, ju the, the dungeon. Hello. This Dre, bring the MP and the SP. Meet me at the center of the earth and travel carefully. Baby, grab the baby, because baby, it ain't much time. Mama Earth is tossing and turning, and that's the sign. So that's where this painting comes from. She's my, like, electric blue. She's my mom figure. She's my, you know, like, tossing and turning because of all the things that are kind of going on and, and what we're just dealing with. The other image is from a Kendrick Lamar song called Keisha's Song. And in that song, he tells a story of a young girl who kind of finds her way to the streets and ends up being killed in the back of a car. And these two paintings sat um, a little bit of a distance away from each other in the gallery. But the idea was like, you know, as this girl is about to lose her life, her head, her head is being held up by Mama Earth's hand. So it's kind of like this connection, this lineage that carries through most of my pieces in the work. Um, some very cool things have happened. So a car got wrapped. <laughs> it was sort of a tribute to Intazaki Shange. So back when I was in undergrad, um, I went to a play by an organization of black women in school, they were doing the play for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough, which was written by Itazaki Shange. It's not really sort of like a book. It's a series of poems that are acted out, on, that are known by their colors. All right, so that's an image from the, of the book. And um, in Jacksonville, there's this place called Yellow House, which at the time looked like this. It was a brand new gallery, but for me, it looked a lot like my grandmother's house. Like my grandmother's house sat on bricks. It just felt like home. So um, the owner of the gallery is Hope McMahon. And I ran up to her at like, I think it was like opening night of her first show there. And I was like, I got this idea. I have this show that's been in my head since I was in college, like 20 years. And I was like, this, it has to be done here. And she handed it over to me. I was the first. Show, solo show in that space, I think. Um, so when you come into the show, you're greeted by these hands that are just kind of suspended. Um, your childhood may have been like mine, but in my childhood, we played a lot of like hand clap games, you know, down by the bank, um, things like that. For me, that was kind of like, as a bunch of little kids, a bunch of little black girls, that was sort of like our first sense of community, community building, you know. This idea of like playing together, working together, having like rules to the game, things like that. You know, you're either in or out. So when you come into the space, these hands welcome you into the space. Five six. But my grandmother was like six one. You know? So in this hallway are these like giant women figures um, that are also playing this game. So they're in the poles of um, down by the bank. Again, kind of creating this community. Um, you have these nails in some of the figure, um, which references like the, I always say this wrong, Inkisi and Kosa, um, <clears throat> which were like the power figures in the Congo. And they would have these sort of like sculptures, these like wooden sculptures that were known as power figures. And while they had a lot of purposes, one of the purposes was um, to sort of like seal contracts. So when they made contracts with one another, they would nail, hammer a nail into it. So I put those into the wall just to symbolize, you know, like how we as black women, um, you know, agree to take care of one another. 
you know, how we agree to kind of lift each other up, how we kind of agree that, you know, at the end of all things, we have each other. So that's why the nails were in the wall. In this room was um, some of the paintings of the women. So in the play, there was like the lady in red, the lady in brown, the lady in blue. So I made a painting for each of the women in the play. And then under each woman was this table. Um, you'll see that what something that comes up in my work a lot are, are, is this notion of like a seat at the table. You know, people always talk about a seat at the table as if it's something you have to take, you know, something women have to take or something that has to be given to women. And I take the notion that, I, you know, for me, I think that we are born with it, that we have it at all times, we just don't know it. Um, and you'll see that come up in the next body of work as well. So for each woman, they have like their own table. Um, and then up under the table, what you see are egg, eggshells, actual real eggshells, like thousands of eggshells that had to be cleaned. <laughs> so if you're an artist in this room, if you're a young artist, sometimes you gotta commit to the work. Um, which was also like a, a great sort of community building aspect to this show. Because a bunch of people had to donate eggs, like chicken farms and people in their kitchen, so that was cool. But the idea was that in this space, um, if you wanted to sort of like interact with these women, these like black women, these women of color on the wall, and you have any sort of like hangups about race or difference and things like that, you know, this whole notion of like, um, um, <clears throat> What's my, what's my egg saying? What can I think of it right now? Walking on eggshells. Walking on eggshells. I don't know why that left me. Um, walking on eggshells. In order to like interact either with these paintings, with these women, or even with the people in the space, you would literally have to walk on the eggshells. And you would have to just, you know, turn these things to dust. So over the process of the show, you would see these eggshells be turned to dust because these conversations are happening and people are interacting with each other, whether they're talking about the work or talking about their day, you know. Different types of people are interacting. So that was the like installation part of this show. That's another one of the paintings. Also in the house was this room. Um, again, I, you know, I, I feel like we have been victims of language. I don't know if y'all can see, can y'all see the words on the wall? Um, the idea of this like white room um, fascinated me. So I took some of those, those words. Some of the words are from the play. Some of the words are just like day-to-day -day things like articulate or pretty for a black girl, you know. And I took the space to just give an idea of like what it's like to be me, you know. That I, whether I want to or not, I exist in these types of spaces all the time, you know where the words, I have to think about the words before I walk into a room. So that, that's what that was for. And then this one, um, this is just a rendering of the painted floor, so you can kind of see it. See the painted floor in the back? In the play, there is a poem called um, Six Blocks. I think I pulled that one too. And she talks about in the poem, um, had sort of like having everything and then moving to Harlem and then her world became like as small as six blocks. When I walked in the Pacific, I imagined waters, I can't talk, I imagined waters ancient from Accra, Tunis, cleansing me, feeding me. Now my ankles are coated in gray filth from the puddle neath the hydrant. So just this idea of, you know, majesty, kind of having everything in the place where we came from, and then ending up in a place where we didn't have very much at all, like this kind of life reducing to these six blocks. And at the time, there was a study, well, not too, too, a little bit before, there was a study that was like measuring, like, do black women feel pain? You know? Why is that a study? Um, but like, do, do people care? Do people think black women feel pain? Like a lot of times, you know, they're like, she's strong, you know, they're strong. So in this, um, not to go too far in the study, but in this like, I wanted to create the six blocks. So it's kind of like a topographical map. 
And in the streets are the words we heard. So I think you guys can see my little blue dot. So there's the W. And then here's the E. Y'all see it? Mm -hmm. The H is down here. So you were in that space, you're literally walking on top of that, you know, in the way that a lot of people just don't know. Mm -hmm. All right. And then the very last thing I did at the end of the show was wrote that on the wall. Um, again, as an artist, um, this teaching moment, like as an artist, you have some control over like proximity. You know, by putting the eggshells on the floor, I force people to engage a little bit more. By writing this on the wall, you can tell how small it is because you can see me writing small. Um, it forces people to come across that floor and get up close to it. And it's more of an, like an intimate experience. So as an artist, you can, you can, you have some control over that, about what the physical person, what the person's physical body does in your space. You also will see lots of hairstyles mm -hmm. in this. Um, over the course of that show, a lot of cool things happen, you know, in terms of just community and engagement. Um, like moments like these in this first picture are really important to me. You know, I'll talk a little bit later about how I didn't see a lot of myself growing up in art spaces. So, you know, community, this, I wasn't here this day. They just decided to do this. And I just think that's, you know, just to engage in that way. All right, last show I'm gonna talk about is kind of where I am now and what's not necessarily leading into my residency here, but let's just, let's just stick with where I am now. This quote, I wish that I were a dragon and could shoot out my anger in a breath of fire. It's from Michaela de Prince, who is a black ballerina. She's from Sierra Leone. She is a professional ballerina. I believe she is, I don't wanna tell you a lie, um, like where she's a principal dancer at. Um, I don't know. Um, but this, my last latest body of work is called Picking. Again, words and language. My understood, at the time, my understanding of the word picking was um, like picaninny. Y'all, have you heard that word picaninny? Which is, was a very sort of like derogative word from slavery about children, black children, you know. Get your picaninnies out of my yard. Um, what I learned in the process of this show, I'm reading Michaela de Prince's book, is that picking just into that is about black women and how people regard black women. And I really wanted to jump into like, when did that start? Like however you people feel, or however I think or perceive that people feel, when did that start? At what point um, does just like a child become this thing that people either love or despise? All right, I have to read it. Um, okay. In spite of the relentless adultification of black girls, you know what adultification is? Um, for those who don't know, sorry. Adultification is when you treat particularly a black girl in the disproportionate discipline rates for black girls in schools, black girls get suspended more, um, put out of school more, written up more for what's considered sub, sub, subjective infractions. Um, sexual, emotional, and physical trauma, the lack of empathy in cases of black girl, black missing and endangered girls, unwarranted police violence, and the age-old myth of the black superwoman, which is that like, she's so strong. All right, you'll see in my work about black girlhood, um, these beads. Um, hair beads are to me definitive, like a definitive symbol, a very specific and singular symbol for black girls. While there may be, I don't know, other children who wear hair beads in their hair. And for me and the, most of the people I know, it's just a part of our history. Like you had them at some point. So I use hair beads in the show, or in my work about black girl for a lot. Again, thinking about language, you see some of the, the things that I heard as a child, or you know, just in my lifetime. Close your pocketbook, you know what that means? So when I was young, and my mom or whoever, somebody, 
But, you know, I might be sitting in church and they're like, close your pocketbook. It means close your legs. So, like, even at a young age, that young, black girls are being sexualized, you know? Um, what you crying for? You know, that kind of, you should be stronger than that. It's like, no, you should be a kid. You know, sometimes kids cry. So the show, again, featured, this show had five of little girls. Each of these girls are presented as just that. They're just presented as children in the painting. But each of them has a little bit of a backstory. You know, I'll kind of talk through a couple of them. I'll give some time for questions. Um, this one is called O. She's like my curious one. She's my, she doesn't need anybody. You know, she, um, has the rainbow from Four Color Girls. In Four Color Girls, I told you there were seven women, Lady in Red, Lady in Brown. So she's like the one that's closest to Intazaki Shange for me. You know, she's, she doesn't need a whole lot. Um, she has the color of red in the back, which is for the deity Oya, who kind of manages um, like the space between like the living and the dead, all right? Over on the other side is Tay. Tay is my reference to two people. Um, Brianna Taylor, who was murdered by the police, and a little girl in Jacksonville named Taylor, who went missing. The whole community went looking for her, and that's that whole like black and endangered girls. And at the end of all of that, she had been murdered by her mother, who looks like me. Um, so in this image, you see the little girl kind of carrying these caution. You know, something's going to happen in this body of work. She's my cautionary tale. Something bad's going to happen. Her, polka, her pajamas have red polka dots. And that's for Breonna Taylor, who was shot in her sleep. So it's symbolic of that. She had the, has the headphones on because she doesn't know what's happening, what's coming. Um, this was actually from a photograph of a friend of mine's child. And it, all of that just kind of like made sense for me. And I was like, so, um, so again, each of the five girls have a different story. Each of them also have what I call an arc. So these are their tables. I told you, like, we're, we were born with our tables. Um, each of them have an arc. It's a little round table with a little stool. The stool has, like, barrettes on the top, the beads on the bottom, and they have these openings in them. The opening represents, like, entering and exiting from adolescence. Because Tay is a cautionary tale. Hers is a full circle because she'll never make it out of adolescence. So that's what, so each of the girls in the show has a tape. Now, fortunately, I get to do for my students what I didn't see as an adult because now I have works like these in art spaces. So now my, because my students model for me all the time. My students get to see themselves in these spaces and be celebrated. And that's really important to me. You know, that's really important to me. So they were recent, this image was recently featured on the cover, and this was on the inside of the Women Writing for a Change anthology. So they got to help me make like the final decision. You know, they just got to say, <laughs> yes. And again, I, that's kind of out of order. That's just one of the stools up close with the barrettes. And then the same thing happened for me. Um, I used to fuss all the time about being a kid and not really being able to see myself in spaces. And recently, I was in a show at the Cummer Museum. And to my surprise, they put my painting on the banner. <laughs> <laughs> All my field trips as a kid were to the comer. And I was just, I loved art, but I was out of play. I like, like, where do I belong in this space? So this meant a lot to me, to kind of have like a full circle moment and to have like a much better relationship with the comer now and, you know, things are good. So, so that's it. That's
chat, you know. So I didn't talk a lot about If not, I'll just kind of talk about my technique a little bit. So, we'll start here. How do you into the Like, you said the red was for another idea. Um, I do, I am as much a teacher, historian, writer, researcher as I am an artist. So, very seldom do I just, I am, which is bad as a teacher, I never sketch. I never just go into my studio and just start painting and, and just to see what happens. Like everywhere, I kind of know where I'm going, but I know it's not going to come until I kind of dive into the research. You know, when I and I'm always trying to tell stories. I'm a storyteller, so I'm going to find some way to tell the story. Black women have just always kind of been the subject matter in my work because it's the thing that I know best, and I am not a fan of telling stories of other people if I can't tell it authentically. You know. So it's always kind of just telling my own story. A lot of times it's, come, it's because things happen. The body work about little, about black girlhood really came up after the little girl Taylor Williams went missing. Missing in the neighborhood where I teach, in both like the, my elementary residency and she went missing. So I don't know, I just, I felt it. And that body work came out of that. So sometimes things happen, you know, sometimes I get a residency and now I get to dive in, into this, this new thing for this residency. I really wanted to, my word, my language, my thing is like resilience. And I am very fascinated with the idea that the um, wait staff and the Ponts were also Negro League baseball players. And it's kind of like this chicken and the egg thing, you know, which came first? Was it Negro League players needing a way to travel? Or was it service staff that were kind of pulled into this baseball thing? So I'm really interested in diving into that and figuring out like some stories about people, like what I can highlight. It'll also be my first time really featuring men. I do have a painting in a show that opens this weekend that has a little boy in it, but even still, he's sort of like, his, the purpose of him is to kind of define the girl's role. So it'll be my first time like painting men. So, just kind of like when things happen, I respond to them. Okay, hold on. He had one, then I'll come in. So I, I was really interested. Um, first of all, the work's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, you're technically very strong, emotionally powerful. Uh, fascinated by your incorporation of installation art with traditional 2D work. Mm -hmm. uh, often I seem to see that as a disconnect, especially in independent galleries where it's all 2D. And an opening night happens, and everybody goes to the free wine table and spends <laughs> two minutes with the work. Mm -hmm. But installation work, you can't escape it. You're, you're in the space. Has that been something that's always been part of your art, or that more <laughs> developed over time, especially as an educator? Um, it's always been a part of my thinking as an artist. Um, in undergrad, no, in grad school, I struggled as a painter which is kind of how I began painting like this. I mean, I can paint, but I hate the process of painting. I hate, I hate rendering. I hate working it to make it look correct. You know, like that doesn't appeal to me. So as in grad school, I struggled to the point where one of my professors was like, look, you're gonna be out of here if you don't figure this out. Right when that happened, we got a new media teacher and he was kind of like my <laughs> open door because he came with installation, sound, video. So what I started to do, because I was, I could like wax poetic, I could talk all day about what my work meant. And the people in the room were like, we don't see that. Like you sound great, but it's not there. So what I did was, at that time I shifted to video. So then I could kind of, the, the work could speak for itself. And that was, that kind of started me into this shift into like, how the space affects the work. You know, singular painting on the wall was at the mercy of the viewer, you know. It is what they thought it was. And I'm always, I'm stuck in this like being obsessed with perception. And I hate that no matter what I wanted it to be, it was what you brought to it. And I wanted to participate in that. So it's just kind of always been there. I think I'm really an installation artist and I'm playing around in paint. And I'm kind of <laughs> taking steps 
You know, it's a strange thing to do. It's an expensive thing to do. You, how do you make money from it? All those things, you know? Um, but, I, but I definitely think I am an installation artist who, who paints sometimes. So. <laughs> um, I'm looking at that painting that up there. Is it image first or color first? Um, it's subject first. I have no, I don't play in color at all. Outside of if it's symbolic, you know, um, in the, the old painting, the little girl with the red, that was symbolic of a deity, that color. Um, the, paint, the background in the other one, it was just the darkest background in the show because Breonna Taylor was killed at night. When I'm doing like works like the one here, for the most part, it's like call and response, you know? I put a color down one day, process along here. In this, you can kind of see, um, I paint flat, so everything sits on a table. Um, and I sort of like paint in puddles. So wherever I want the color to be, you can see with the brush, I am really just putting, applying water. I put water where I want the color to be, and then I'm using like eyedroppers um, to drop the paint. It's mainly like acrylic ink or fluid acrylic. And I'm dropping the paint where the water is. It's a long process. <laughs> I can only do about two or three colors a day, um, and it has to dry overnight. So I tend to paint about four or five things at a time and just kind of bounce around in my studio. Um, whatever I do today, I go in tomorrow and I respond to. So very seldom do I kind of like plan what color things are gonna be, unless it means something. So, you know, I think like in the one before, you can see a little bit of a red line around her face. This painting is from, I'm, I've just finished the body of work about um, red lining in Jacksonville. So this is one of the characters in a story that talked about that. So there's like a red line around her, but outside of that, it's not really plain. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? In back. Um, so I think you spoke like in your your great time painting. What is it that brought you back? Um, art. I stopped for, I was in Atlanta. Um, I was kind of, I wasn't miserable, but I wasn't happy. I was teaching high school art, um, which consumed my life. I was a high school teacher. I was not an artist. And um, I just kind of walked away at that point. I decided to come back to Jacksonville. And when I came back to Jacksonville, I came back to Jacksonville to be an event planner. You know, I was like, I'm gonna start an event business. And that's what I did. I started an event business and lived in that space for like seven years or so. And out of the blue, I had no clue, number one, that there was an art community in Jacksonville. I thought art in Jacksonville was flamingos and palm trees. Forgive me, other fellow artists, you know. Um, that's what I thought it was. So I never thought about coming to Jacksonville and being an artist. But then one day I saw like a posting for an artist talk and I went to it. And some people who are very close to me today were giving an artist talk. Um, if I'm remembering right, it was Overstreet Nikos, Dustin Harewood, and Princess Simpson Rashid. And I was like, oh, Thank you, this is happening here. And that was like the spark for me to get back in it. There was a show at the Ritz, and I asked the curator, I was like, I haven't been here. So if you need work, it's going to be seven years old. And she said, turn it in. And I had that first show. And so when I had the, you had a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I had several, but I'll go <laughs> to one. Um, who are the current contemporary black artists that you are paying attention to? I am obsessed with Ebony G. Patterson, um, who, you know, it's so like tactile. There's like these um, visually stunning pieces that are like glitter. Also does um, work. There's these like videos, like you'll have, be in like a small space with these videos of like black men just being black men. And you're just standing in that space, kind of absorbing that, you know, these humans. So her work feels kin to mine in that way. Um, so I would definitely say her. Who else? Deborah Roberts is big for me. She has a show in Jacksonville next year. Um, just this idea, one, one we both are working on, Bodies of Work About Black Girlhood, 
but just this idea of like these pieces that come together. Like as an artist, I don't, I told you I don't like rendering. I love the idea of like construction, of like layers and pieces coming together. Like I see the layers in my painting as kind of like, you know, all the kind of like stains and things that sort of build up who we are or who these people are. As a collage artist, Deborah Roberts' work really appeals to me just because of that, this kind of construction. This like, all these sort of like disparate pieces that come together to make that individual person who they are, like how it shows like connection to everybody. So I would say those two. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I have a very convoluted, I think I'll be asking it as I'm trying to describe what, I mean, like I was just really interested when you were talking about this whole idea of the gaze and because your paint do have, I don't want to say confrontational quality, but that's a good word. Looking, right, like mm -hmm. you said when they were across from each other, they're really looking at each other, it's a conversation, but it's also this kind of standoff and mm -hmm. when you were comes in between and then the viewer can take place one painting and right and traditionally mm -hmm. right like the gaze is all about like consumption and domination and it's a power differential and it's binary and i think you bring it up um like i don't think that you're just trying to you know like take black girls who have been historically disempowered and like make them the power figures and make us all subservient to right. them by you know making these big monumental Thing. But I was just wondering if you talk about that mm -hmm. a little bit more, like those relationships and how you see power in that or how you dispel those typical notions. It is the idea that um, it's not even so much about reclaiming power. Mm -hmm. It's about saying, let's reconsider what we were told. Um, let's redefine it for ourselves. So it's not so much about person's power you know away from them and brush them aside it's just this sort of like recognition that I see you too you know I understand you I know the language that you speak I know what those like baby hairs mean I know what those hair beats mean I know that you aren't um whatever stereotype or if somebody thinks you are I kind of know how you got there so the gaze for me it's not about stealing it away from somebody else. It's about um, initiating it with someone who looks like me and having that conversation. So when I say the viewer either like interrupts it or participates in it, that's really on the viewer, you know? But the work itself, my intention, at the end of the day, I make work for people who look like me. I don't wanna say that. I make work for black women and girls so that they can see in the work. Simple as that. Everything else that comes with that, wonderful. But intention, I am trying to fill the space that was not available to me when I was young. You know, black girls, black women should see and understand themselves in fine art spaces, in these sort of like high, you know, spaces. We shouldn't be eliminated from it. So I have the power to, to not only put the image there, but to bring you into the space to and, and change the conversation. So does that make sense? I think mean, it's equal. I mean, okay. I, and I love the fact that you're saying you're talking to a very specific audience mm -hmm. and that like the white person I'm really kind of like inside the fact because And it's it's kind of like the opposite. It's kind of like the role that we play yeah. to like the greater art community in history. Yeah. Just kind of like we can use the word sort of like disregard it. And I'm not saying that you are disregarding and you're not there. I'm just saying right now, in this moment, my priority is like that little girl and what she thinks about herself in this moment. And I want to make sure that I kind of become her ground zero versus everything else that's, that's going to come if it hasn't come yet. So, any other questions? <laughs> this is like a, um, a silly question that I ask the most visiting artists and sometimes it's just a room full of like students that are about to graduate as fine art majors that are freaked out about being in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you have so many accomplishments, but I think it's so wonderful to hear, especially with students where, like, graduating into the world, we're likely not going to just have one job. We'll have many jobs, and usually we'll have multiple side hustles, and that's how you pay bills. And, and you were so generous in like sharing that you moved back to Jacksonville to be an event planner. Mm -hmm. um, for all of us in the room, our life can feel uncertain and we may be doing many things, but we still have creative endeavors. Would you share some of your other like, just like practical, because I know mm -hmm. you have the, the business, right, where you're yeah. like helping artists like apply their skills, but most artists usually to exist have to yeah, do many roles. You kind of just have to decide what you need at that moment. Um, when I left art to becoming an event planner, like at the time I didn't really, a couple things were happening. Um, I was kind of like a young struggling artist in Atlanta, although I had made some headway. It's not like nothing was happening. But I was like, I don't know. I was teaching. Remember, teaching kind of stripped a lot of the whole be an artist thing for me. Um, and that at the time, teaching is because I needed to make some money. I was poor. <laughs> I needed a job. And teaching consumed me. So that was the first thing that kind of pulled me away from it. When I came to Jacksonville again, art wasn't on my mind. I had always been like the creative friend that people called to make their invitation and all those things. So it was just kind of a natural progression to that. And I ran that business for some time with other people. So I would do the design and other people would do the planning stuff. When the planner stepped out of the business, I realized how much I hated it. I don't do this, you know. And it was just in that time that I kind of found my way back to art. But you kind of have to decide for yourself. If you're walking into the art world right now, there's nothing but space and opportunity. Like all of y'all could be like millionaires in like six months. There's so many things. You have like the old, you got the NFT thing. You can run your own gallery online. You can do all the things yourself. You know, you are the social media gurus. You can do all the things that at a certain point in my life, I had to go to other people for. I had to be welcomed into the door, a whole other thing, you know. But y'all can do all that yourself. So, um, I don't know, creators, sometimes we're a little kind of all over the place anyway, so we kind of have to serve. I'm Gemini, you know, we got to serve all those people. Um, so the different things that I've done have really just come from that. I don't think I will ever just be an artist. I think I'll always teach. I love teaching. I'm, I'm very specific about who I teach, not in terms of race, but um, in terms of the context where in which I teach, like public school is not. Um, but as much as I want to do this thing, I want to like give it back. I want to like teach that whole like rise and lift is just a part of who I am. So I think I'll always teach. Um, the artist type thing just kind of came out of necessity. I wrote, I did my whole like CV thing and I want a grant in Jacksonville. And then people started calling me like, hey, can I see your CV? And you know, I spent years owning a business so I understood that where there's a problem, you know, where there's a need, a lack, a business owner solves the problem. So that's where that business came from. Like, people kept calling me for mine, so I created a template. And I created a system to make um, writing an artist statement easy and writing an artist bio easy. And then I put it out there. And that was kind of it. So it's just always sort of come that way for me. Everybody else, it's just a matter of what you need now. If in order to, if you love art, and in order to make art um, in a happy place, you got to go to work somewhere, go to work somewhere. You know, it won't last forever. Or figure out how to make the money yourself. I don't care what you sell. Sell your socks, <laughs> sell t-shirts, take your art, put it on a shirt, you know, do all the things. If you do take on that role and you kind of start to sell your work in different sort of like ways, teach yourself about value. Make sure you aren't like, taking your like $10,000 painting, putting it on a $25 shirt, and devaluing the $10,000 painting. So take some time to learn that, like how to balance those things, but do, like, do it all. Why not, you know? No. All right, thank you. All right, that's it. Thank Anyone you. Else?